Today's forum will feature five Olympic gold medal swimmers from the Sacramento region. How did their lives change after becoming an Olympian? And what are their thoughts about the Tokyo Games? We welcome back Beth Ruyak, formerly from Capital Public Radio, who will moderate the discussion. And now here's Beth. Thank you, Chris. And hi to each of you. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you to the Renaissance Society for assembling this team of Olympians who have each called Sacramento home. And one of them still does. That's a trivia question that you can listen for for a little bit later on. You're going to meet the Olympians in a moment. I am Beth Ruyak. I am your host. This conversation is also going to include your voice. The way to do that is to look on that bar at the bottom of the picture and where you see Q and A, click on that and you should be able to type in your question. And then I'll work in the questions as we go along throughout the event. We are here for 90 minutes. Hope you're gonna be here for that duration. So without any more moments notice, I'm going to let you say hello to our panelists. They are popping in now. Here's our group. Jeff Float is joining us. There's Mark Spitz. Hi, Mark. Hi, Jeff. We are watching hello. right now. Hi, there's Mike Burton. Okay. <laughs> just back from the Mexico games, I see, Mike. Yeah, just got in. <laughs> Summer Sanders Schlopi is joining us from her college girls weekend reunion. We are so privileged to be cutting into that special time. And Debbie Meyer is with us too, all the way from North Carolina. Hi, everyone. Great to have you here. Beth. Thanks, Beth. I'm happy to see everybody. Everybody looks awesome. All Hi, of you Hi, Debbie. <laughs> so that, that prompts a question here, and I don't know if you can see us all in a group, but at least you can answer this with an audible. Have all of you ever been together in person before? Partially. Partially. You know? <laughs> partially, I think partially. I think at the 84 trial, we were all together. I don't know about summer, but uh, Debbie, Mike, and Mark were, you know, at uh, Indianapolis. That's the last time I recollect, but I don't know about summer. I, I was not at your guys' trials, but I went to the 84 games and cheered cheered whoever it was, whoever made it and was competing. I cheered them on and it was a, a complete freak of a spectator, but that's when my dream <laughs> I'm sure, I'm actually sure that we probably have all been at a swim something together. Um, but you know what, Beth, we don't get to see each other often enough. Um, so it's just, an, I'm just so excited to see everybody's faces and everybody looks healthy and good and happy. And I think that's awesome. Well, the truth is without Zoom, I don't think we could do this. We couldn't get you all back here in one place at one time. And so this is really wonderful. So that everybody gets a bit of a feel for your background. Um, I'm going to go a little bit one at a time here with some questions. And Debbie, I'm going to start with you. Debbie, as many people in the Sacramento know, and a lot of your classmates remember this in high school when you won the three gold medals at the 1968 games in Mexico City. That was the 200 free, the 400 free, the 800 free, and you became the first swimmer. I don't know if that's on Team USA or in the world, Debbie, to win three individual gold medals in one Olympics, and, and you did it at just 16 years of age. So first of all, clarify, was that for Team USA or anyone in the world? I think anyone in the world, as that's far as I, I know. Yeah, that's what I suspected. You it's went cool. on to win 15 world records. Will you talk about how it changed your life to have had such a powerful experience at such a young age? And I know that today you were just talking to kindergartners about the Olympics. So you were a teenager. What did this mean? You know, a teenager at that time in the 60s, that was kind of the norm for the girls. Um, today, it's not because Title IX was not in existence at that time. There really wasn't any. There were a few team college teams with AIAW, but uh, it, it did change my life. It changed it a lot. Um, I grew to love aquatics a little bit more. Um, I did not compete in Munich because the actual fun of training 
and competing just kind of died. But I still had the love of, of aquatics and I followed swimming. I got into coaching. I've coached high school. I've coached college, um, division one, division three. Um, I um, had my swim school. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit later about your relationship with Katie Ledecky. And it was amazing to see her jump out of the pool and poolside call you out and thank you for being a mentor. So we'll get back to that in a little bit. I want to go to Mike Burton because Mike, you won two gold medals at the same games, the 1968 games, thus your shirt. <laughs> Yours were in the 400 free and the 1500 free. But the amazing part of your story is then that four years later, you defended that 1500 meter title. You set a new world record. And that race is often highlighted as one of the most, um, in terms of individual races, biggest surprises, most biggest upsets, if you will, in swimming history. And you weren't favored to win, but the circumstances, we could get into a long story, put you in a position of being the USA's best hope. So I want you to talk a little bit about the mental game of competing versus the physical game and, and be personal about it for yourself. Where, where were you with that? Well, I'm glad you asked. You know, in Munich, well, actually, none of my races was I ever favored. Um, you know, I was able to, you know, get on the blocks and do a good job. But the reason for that, I think, is because whenever I was on the blocks and ready to swim, it was like I was going to win. I never, never entered a race that I didn't think I was going to win. And uh, so that made a big difference in how I competed and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, you know, Rick DeMont uh, was disqualified just prior to the race or that morning uh, because of uh, his uh, asthma medicine contained ephedrine and that was banned from the, uh, the Olympics. So, and I was talking to uh, a great coach, Peter Dalen, at the... Uh, 2008 Olympic trials and a few other guys were standing around. I, and I, I wish I could remember who the per person was that said this. He said, you know, if Rick had been in the race, who would have won? And I, I said, you know, we're, we're never going to know because he wasn't in the race. <laughs> and Peter goes, good answer. Yeah. 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 Because I think you're, you're leaning heavily on the power of the mental game. And two people in the pool at the same time, you know, who knows? It's not just sheer skill and talent. Although I think Jeff Float thinks it's, it's both. And we'll get to Jeff right now because, Jeff, your history is interesting too. You made that 1988 team that was boycotted, ironically, because I say ironic because of the times that we're in, Russia had invaded Afghanistan and that prompted the boycott. But you hung around and four years later, 1984, you were back in the pool, you were competing and you were on that four by 200 gold medal relay, also chosen as team captain. So you can talk about mental versus physical, but as a hearing impaired athlete, Jeff, I think people do want to know how your story affected people, what what you have heard over the years from people about that. And literally, what do you hear when you're swimming? Uh, well, that's a loaded question. Um, so in 1980, I was a sophomore at USC and uh, the, the game were awarded to LA kind of during that time. But in 1980, we were riding a, a wave of um, the American beating the Russians in high hockey in the Miracle on Ice in February. Oh, that's right, that's right. So, you know, we were rampant with our patriotism. And in April was when we found out we were gonna be boycotting the games and our trials were in June. So, you know, literally we were getting ready to peak when, when we heard the news. And it was kind of like, I was, a, I was kind of like a walking zombie. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how it was gonna turn out. You know, the trials turned out to be kind of a going through the motion you know, an honorary team um, was, was put together and we ended up going to Hawaii 
where the boycott swimming nations got together while the uh, Moscow Games were going on or just before. We were trying to compete against the times and it just didn't, didn't have any of the feel or any of the excitement at all. So it was a very difficult time, but I fortunately had two more years of college eligibility right. that kind of kept me motivated. And I, I'd ride my bike next to, you know, to where the pool was being built on campus. And that was provided more motivation for me to stick with it. And, and I had my teammates fall back on and NCAA and that kind of environment. So that was kind of my um, motivation. To, to yeah, that, that's, to your, that's your mental game in action as a young person, right? Well, uh, you know, you ask me, what, what do I hear in the water? It, what, one of the beauties is you don't have to necessarily hear Except for we could hear Sherm yelling at us all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sherm is the coach. Sherm Shabor is <laughs> Sherm Shabor is the famous coach of four of these five Olympians. And summer, I think Mike Hastings is cut from the same cloth or was in the same tradition. So anyway, you you all had um, a dose of that magic. Yeah, well, uh, it's funny, you know, uh, with with summer, uh, Mike Hastings was her coach, and Mike was my age group coach when I was eight, 10 years old at Arden Hill. So in essence, that uh, Sherm's influence had a lot to do with Mike and Mike and his success. And in fact, I think even Mike Casey was uh, down on 68 trials, you know, uh, for, for Mike and Debbie and Mark. So, you know, it, uh, uh, the influence has been phenomenal. Okay, Jeff, just tell me quickly, are you somebody that hear- hearing impaired people reach out to? Are you... Um, uh, an enduring role model for people with not just deafness, but any kind of disability that they need to strive against for what their dreams are? Well, you never know how far reaching an impact you yeah. have on somebody. Um, and I've, I've experienced that, you know, as you know, when I, your, your daughter swam with me at Gold River and, and you know, the, the, in, the inspiration that you provide people you just never know how far reaching, whether they're deaf or hearing impaired or whatever it might be. And so it, it has been just, you know, things come out of the woodwork when you least expect it. So it, it's just been a really a great um, way to give basketball support and, um, you know, uh, it's just the abilities to, to be able to share that with the future generations. Right. And I said striving against, I'm, I'm going to correct myself there because I see and know so many people who work with whatever their challenges are. And the, the challenge might be a roadblock, but they don't necessarily work against it. You know, they incorporate it and, and make that part of their life in a way that works um, in tandem with who they are. Well, it's just turning your disadvantage into an advantage. And to me, exactly. you know, being hearing impaired is kind of like a, a filter in my way. Uh, the filter's out the, the, you know, the, the noise I don't need to hear and I can focus on the things I want to focus on. I think that was one of the things that was good for me is I didn't need to necessarily hear, you know, what was going on around me. I could just focus in the water and, and that kind of that uh, environment, quiet environment to begin with. So it was just... All right. I'm going to move on to summer and talk about summer's gold medals, which I was able to witness myself. I was working for NBC at the time and happened to be assigned to swimming at the time of her races. Summer won two gold medals um, individually in the 200 meter butterfly and then collectively in the four by 100 medley relay. Her silver came in the 200 um, meter individual medley and then the bronze in the 400 meter individual medley. This was all at the 1992 games. Jeff, by the way, if we didn't clarify, had been at the 1984. Summer then had a stunning college career at Stanford and obviously still a big group of friends, her own uh, mutual cheering section they're celebrating this weekend. But by 1992 summer, Athletes and swimmers could be professional as opposed to amateur. And even though the world of social media wasn't happening then, sports were changing because of that. So could you give us a little bit of insight into the decision-making that you had to do coming out of the Olympics and, and college and how to navigate what your life and your career were going to be? 
Yeah, well, first of all, I have to tell everyone and probably the rest of the panelists that every single picture that I have of my gold medal moment includes Beth in the background. <laughs> <laughs> like, she's there and it's awesome. So, I mean, it's so cute how long we've known each other and Aww. how we were yeah. there for all of my really important, uh, you know, um, sporting moments. But um, yes, 1992, internet was not invented. It was just like, you know, the interwebs and the World Wide Web was just coming to terms. No cell phones. So social media didn't, didn't exist. I'm always, and I, I think the rest of the panelists probably would agree with me. I'm really impressed with the athletes right now that they can even deal with standing on the blocks for an Olympic Games or an Olympic trials with the pressure of social media on their shoulders. I find that to be crazy. So I didn't have that. Um, but I had an incredible, uh, support system and you mentioned Mike Hastings, he was on the pool deck and then Richard Quick. So, um, for me, 1992, uh, and in fact, Beth, I had given up my eligibility before the Olympic games. So we termed it differently back then. It was giving something up. It wasn't turning pro. Um, it was the, it was the biggest decision of my then life. I called it my first big girl decision at 19 years old. And I had to make it. My dad was like, I can't be responsible for this one. So I knew I wanted to work in television. I knew that that was a passion and a goal equivalent to swimming in the Olympic games. And my dad said, my gut told me I should give up my eligibility and I should parlay this, whatever I was doing into the next phase of my life. But my dad said, listen, if you do, you have to pay for Stanford. So you need to make at least 50 grand a year. Um, cause wow. he was not footing that bill. And so wow. <laughs> I made my first big girl decision. And then y'all one week later, I called my dad and said, do you think the NCAA would let me take that decision back? Because, <laughs> oh, <no. sighs> because I didn't really comprehend or understand how important the team yeah. was to me. I mean, I was a true team swimmer. I know I stood on the blocks as myself, but I really didn't. And that was the joy and the fun in my sport was my team. And when you give up your eligibility, you give up that right to be a part of the team. And so all of a sudden I was swimming my races for Stanford, but I was swimming during diving breaks and they were called exhibition races. And it was by myself. There was no fun in that. And so the love of my sport just sort of slowly eroded and I still love swimming but I didn't know why I was doing it without my team. So long-winded answer to your question, but that was a very, very difficult decision for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't change anything. I would still go down that same road. Well, that's the place to be with those kinds of choices in life, right? And that's some of the theme of what I want to talk to Mark about. Mark Spitz, the winner of two gold medals in the 68 games where Debbie and Mike were, and then going on to 1972, those Olympics in Munich with the seven gold medals, each one with a world record. And suddenly the whole world knew who Mark Spitz was. And um, everybody knew that mustache and long hair in the pool as well. And we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of that time, which will be next year. So Mark, will you tell me how reflective you're feeling? And at this point, what's becoming most meaningful to you about your swimming legacy? Well, you want this in four sentences or four volumes? Yeah. Can you do it in four sentences? That'd be awesome. <laughs> Don't sit around and think about it, to be honest with you a lot. Um, on this Sunday, I'm actually flying with my wife to Munich, Germany, doing a documentary film with the International Olympic Committee that they're producing that will be actually viewed in September 4th of next year, exactly the date I won my seventh gold medal. Wow. Now, I've been to Munich, Germany many, many times and certainly visited the, uh, the swimming hall and um, had a chance to reflect on it. And it's not quite exactly the same as I recall it to be when I was there at the Olympics, they've taken out 20,000 grandstands and there's a big glass window and it's kind of empty and it's a little on the dark side because they don't have the television lights going. And, and obviously there's a void of the atmosphere of the Olympic games. Um, 
And, and that in of itself is sort of an interesting thing to handle because I think every one of us has probably visited the swim complex that we've had such great success. And it's sort of like an echoing feeling of being there. Um, it's not depressing, but it's like, you know, I don't like looking back. Um, and I like looking sort of at movies or videos that I can see of the uh, presentation. Th there's, there's one video that I saw that they're going to use. And I have a little bit of the production say so in this. And I had never seen this before, but it was a perspective um, of a camera following Sherm Shavor and myself. And we happened to be walking past the uh, awards uh, stand where you get your gold medals. And in the view is 20,000 people going crazy uh, for whatever event was occurring. Now, I had evidently finished an event because I had one of these special bottles of water that were sealed so that I could do my drug testing. And, and from that perspective, it was kind of funny because I said, boy, that was actually really me there. The only films I'd ever seen before was me swimming. And, oh, and, and so, but yeah. not moving yeah. about. Um, yeah. And it kind of brought back a memory that, wow, this really happened to me. Uh, yeah. Because it's been so many years that when I view this, and I don't know how the other panelists feel, it's like, wow, that was me. I kind of thought I remembered it a lot. But every time <laughs> I see it now, there's things that I can't have, I didn't remember that all of a sudden it, I can see this in the video. So look, I, I think I share something common with everybody. And that is, is that we all tried to do the best that we could be at that time and in that moment. And we were called the duty to perform for ourselves and our country. And I was, I think, just an ordinary guy that on one particular time trained for whatever it was, 14 some odd years to make that happen. Um, one of the things that you had mentioned um, of my accomplishments in Mexico City is, is that you forgot about my silver and bronze medal. And those are just as important. Yes, um, and my fact, apologies, you're right. Oh, no, that's, right. that's okay. Um, but the fact was, is that my expectations of going into my first Olympics was, I was swimming everything that I qualified to swim in, some of which of those events I held a world record. And some of those, I was just happy to be in the event, like the 100 meter freestyle. Because my coach at the time, George Haynes, said, if you swim it, you swim fast enough, and you're one of the first four guys uh, at the Olympic trials, you may be able to make the, med uh, the sprint relay. And so not only did I qualify, I ended up getting second in the event, and that put me actually in the event. And that was the very first event on the very first day. And I, my bronze medal was extremely important to me because I can't believe I even medaled. I'd only had the experience of swimming that event for about seven weeks. Um, uh -huh. I never tried to swim that event. You know, so, I, I'm, I don't I want to mean, interrupt to me, you, Mark. I do want to tell you, though, that Olympic athletes can look at a bronze as a gold, like you're describing, when a, a silver or bronze mean the world. And they can also look at it as, as a failure because it wasn't gold. And I, I did a glittery introduction of you talking <laughs> just about the gold. But I think the point you're making is really well taken in the nuance of all the circumstances around your performance and, and how you did. So I can answer the question sort of in a long-winded example because of the fact that I think that when I reflect back, it's the journey I took. Hmm. It's everything that happened to me um, yeah. from yeah. all the races that I lost. You know? And there I were think, many I mean, of those. And, uh, and I lost a big race that cost me two gold medals in Mexico City. Um, and I, I learned from that. And I, it's not that I wasn't going to fall down. It's how well you get up. And I think that I made it a point for the next four years to make sure that that didn't happen. Of course, with all the possibilities that it, it could possibly happen again. So somebody once said to me uh, at an Olympic event in 2000 that I was a guest uh, in Sydney, Australia, and they asked me sort of sheepishly, what do you think your greatest accomplishment was? And I said, well, I think maybe winning seven gold medals in Munich. And the guy said, no, that wasn't your greatest accomplishment. So I kind of was listening. Okay, what is that? It kind of reminded me of that commercial from EF Hutton. And my broker says, and then everybody turns their head. <laughs> and says, well, you know, what are we going to invest in? And he said, well, I looked at the last bunch of times that you swam in international competitions and all the world records you had. And you swam in about from the first time you broke a world record when you were 17 years old until you finished swimming in 1972, you were in about 76 different competitions. Oh. 
You had 35 world records. So statistically, about 50% of the time, you were going to break a world record. But in the last two years, of the 20 times that you swam, you had 19 world records. And you won all of those events. He says, that I think is your greatest accomplishment. And I said, hmm, that's an interesting statistic. Of course, swimming doesn't have statistics like that, like in baseball. But I said, well, that again, that's part of my journey. Yeah. You know? And, yeah, and that and I, was it. I think I think everyone would say the journey. Uh, Summer, I want to point out, and this is not to say anything about anybody's ages, anyone's, but Summer, you were born the year that all this was happening to Mark. Isn't that <laughs> <so> funny? <laughs> I, am with, I am with all my college girlfriends, and we just got done saying it's our 50th year. What are we going to do for our 50th birthdays? So when Mark was saying that he's celebrating his 50th anniversary of his gold medal. And then obviously Debbie talking about title nine. I mean, I'm so fortunate that I was born in 1972. You know, I mean, I, I got a lot of opportunity by being a title nine baby and, and, you know, Debbie paved the way for that. Many other Donna De Verona, Billie Jean King, all these people that came before me, they're so amazing. But yes, I, um, but I, you know, that's the history of the amazing area that we all grew up in, that we got to swim in and the, the rich tradition of swimming in the Sacramento Valley. It's unbelievable. And I was like, I get to see all these people and hear about them and try my best to live up to them. You know, so Summer, I, what, go ahead, Debbie. What you said about a team, that's the one thing that I think would have kept me going on to Munich because I quit because the fun went out of practice. I was swimming with a lot of 13 and 14 year olds at the time. I got Mike in the morning, but he was working in the afternoon a lot of times at Sac State. So, you know, I was basically by myself, like you said, with Stanford, but I do wish I had the opportunity to swim in college and just be 18. Mm -hmm. And now so, these women are getting that opportunity, which is so amazing because who knows when you really would have hit your peak in your prime, right, Debbie? Exactly. I mean, my goodness. Mm -hmm. um, Mark made this point, we're, we're kind of going around it. And that is when you look back at some of the video or um, pictures of you swimming these Olympic races we're talking about, I. I am curious, let's see if I can put this on a scale of one to 10, how much, how close you feel as a person to that person in the image, in the picture or the video, 10 would be, oh, I feel right there, right. That person one would be, it's like an out of body experience. So here goes, I want to put us in a boardroom to discuss this. So, <laughs> so, um, I think I'm going to have a little help here. here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're all in the boardroom, and uh, I'm having flashbacks of Celebrity Apprentice. I mean, this oh is my gosh. <laughs> that's hilarious. Okay, so um, to my far right is Mike. Mike, one to ten. When you look back, how close do you feel to that person in 1968? Well, in 68, I believe I was that person. <laughs> and I'll, and I'll tell you why a lot of people don't know that uh, during the course of my career in swimming I took a minute off the 1500 meter time world mm. record mm. entire minute mm. and so that was a lot of hard swimming and that took a lot of preparation planning and trying to stay ahead of mark at Arden Hills <laughs> okay that sounds like a nine or a ten then in the answer yeah, absolutely Okay, uh, Mark, you're next sitting to Mike in my boardroom picture here. Um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're talking about 50 years. So how close do you feel to that person? Well, not in shape, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you, there's an old adage I've used, when you fail to prepare, you're prepared to fail. I mean, here's a perfect example like that. Don't ask me to get in the pool. But from a weight point of view, I weigh within three pounds um, oh. of that weight. And I, I, think that, I think that all that I learned from swimming carries with me every day. Um, the discipline of trying to approach something and the realization that it's not going to happen overnight. 
my expectation is, is that you need to put in the work and you need to do be, be very due diligence with the people that you surround yourself with. I've always tried to maintain that I should be the stupidest person in the room. And therefore I have the most to learn from those that are smarter than me. Um, and so, and I kind of looked up to my coaches. Um, maybe Sherm Shavor didn't think that at the time because I always questioned whether or not I should show up at practice. I mean, there was one time, for an example, that he actually got in the car and he gave all those guys, I don't know, some stupid thing like five fifteen hundreds of doing. He drove to get me. Um, OK, but, wait, I'm, I'm still listening for your one to ten answer here. Well, I think that probably. I don't know, seven and a half. OK, I'll take it. It's a good diving score. All right. So. <laughs> Debbie, you're next, one to 10. Oh my gosh. I am, some ways I'm the same. I'm a 10. Okay. I've got that desire. I've got that determination. I've got that dedication. I've got that competitiveness in me. Ask my husband when we're on the golf course or on a ski hill. Um, I always want to better myself. I always want to learn something new every day. Like I told the kids in the kindergarten class today. But Personality wise, can ask Mike, I am not the same person. I was a naive, introverted little person. And as Mrs. Moulton at Rio Americana used to say, you guys have verbal diarrhea. So <laughs> I, am, I am totally a different person personality wise. I, I'm, I think I'm still humble because when people talk about me, I get embarrassed. Yeah. But um, I, so I'd say probably about a seven. Okay. Well, um, Jeff, you're next. What do you think? Well, when the Olympic come around, the Olympic trials come around, I am that athlete from 1984. I mean, I, I feel what those swimmers are going through. I know what the coaches have done to get those swimmers re ready. And I, I feel like, like as Mark said, as soon as I dive in the water, I'm nowhere near with <laughs> swimmer, you know, but uh, all those things that I've learned, you know, from, from the past carry with me today. Um, I'm grateful for each and every one of you that have come before me, um, Mike and Mark and Debbie. Um, you know, a common denominator we talked about earlier was, you know, Sherm Shavur, and he was 10 years ahead of his time. And from the perspective, my perspective, I was a six, seven, eight year old when you guys were doing your thing. And they were breaking the record by 20 seconds, 30 seconds at a time. I mean, I think, Debbie, you were at the, um, the YMCA pool. You broke the American record by 20 seconds there. Is that yeah. right? Uh, yeah, and Mike, that was you know, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah. Mike, you know, breaking a, 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 the trials, I think, in 68, you broke the mile record by 20 seconds. People were just blown away. Mm -hmm. You know, and so the gratitude of, of, of having you in my life is like, you guys were my big brothers and sisters, you know, because I had an older brother and sister that was about my age and was at El Camino High School when Mike was there for a senior year. And, and, and my sister was in the first graduating class at Rio Americano and, and you know, where Debbie was. And so they were like my big brothers and sisters. And, um, you know, it was just a, a, a great way to grow up. You know, when we had a, a golden time, charm. And what wait, wait. Us. Wait, we can't talk about Sherm till I hear your one to ten. I I want to know it's how a much. Ten. It's a ten. It's a ten. Okay. ten. Yeah, yeah. Jeff yeah. is the coach of. I believe. I believe that's Maybe eleven. So so yeah, I'll give you an eleven on that. All right, <laughs> Summer. We kind of got to this answer with you a little bit, but I'm going to put you on the one to ten scale with everyone else since we're in the boardroom. So yeah, I um, of course I've changed, but I'm still the same. Mm -hmm. So at the core of who I am, I'm I'm my dad's daughter, my mom's daughter. Uh, so I'm at, I'm 9.5, Jeff, just to be a little bit different. <laughs> just to be right. a little wiggle room of being a little bit different, but at the core of my being, I'm exactly the same person. Debbie's known me my entire life, basically. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, yeah. remember when you had your, your parade in Roseville before going to the games? <laughs> when I had my- remember that? When I had my wisdom teeth taken out. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> yes, she was waving on the uh, 
a convertible and your grandpa was there and dad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I so had a, really quickly sidebar, just because it might be funny for the crowd, but my dad was a dentist and he said, you need to get your wisdom teeth out. So you can either be swollen for vacation or swollen for your parade. And I was like, oh, I'm going to be swollen for my parade. And I was lit. I mean, golf ball, like double golf balls down here. Like this. <laughs> classic. Yeah, I'm exactly the same, I think. I, I love this um, very close family, real life kind of small town life that I'm hearing in your stories and in all the things you're saying. So because of that sort of intimate feel, let's get the heck out of the boardroom and get back to the way we were. There we go. There we go. Okay. Can you imagine if somebody just tuned in when we were all sitting there like that and thought the forum's going to be like this all? <laughs> If you are just joining us, I am Beth Ruiak, and I am talking with five legendary Olympians, gold medalists, and silver and bronze medalists, too, and world record holders, and world-level com competitors who are from the Sacramento area. We're reflecting on Olympic swimming from years gone past. We have had Summer Sanders and Jeff Float, Debbie Meyer, Mark Spitz, and Mike Burton talking with us. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the Tokyo games. And um, Debbie, I said we'd get back to talking about Katie Ledecky. I also messaged each of you just as the games were beginning and asked your thoughts going into the games. And Debbie, yours is one of the emails I got back. So you said, as I am sitting here watching Katie swim the first ever final in the 1500, I'm trying to realize that I was in a situation <laughs> two events 53 years ago. Can I understand what I did then? No, I still do realize what I did. No, I don't realize what I did and I'm not sure I ever will. So talk about the mentorship, Katie at the Tokyo games and, and what swimming is and does to a person. Well, with Katie, I first met her after the 2012 games. Um, it actually was a long time after, it was 2014. We were at a conference, a swimming convention in Florida and I'd never met her. So I went up to someone, I said, oh, I wanna meet Katie Ledecky, I wanna meet Katie Ledecky. And they go, you haven't met her yet? And I said, no. So this gentleman, Bill Maxim took me up to introduce me and I said, Katie, this is Debbie Meyer, and her parents were standing right next to her. And her mother just went gaga because apparently I was her hero because she was a distant swimmer in the, her day of swimming. And of course, that embarrassed me to no tears, but that started our relationship. And then um, I met her again at the, the trials in 12 and in 16 and I mean in 16 and, and um, I didn't go to 20, but I would go down to Stanford and I would talk to her there and, you know, I got pictures with her with my granddaughter and, you know, Chris Muntz also was with me who was a Stanford grad from grad school. And she was also our um, chaperone in 68 and a three-time Olympic gold medalist herself who, you know, lives in Sacramento as well, but swam out of Santa Clara with Mark. And um, I just became friends with her and we would text back and forth. And, you know, I said, you know, you're having a chance of a lifetime here that you get to be the first one ever in that FINA or that IOC book with your name for the 1500 and um, freestyle. And, you know, during the games, I, we just would chat and say, good luck, have fun, enjoy it. You know, always remember what you did because I never kept a diary and I wish I did. As Mark had said, seeing events and seeing films from other, you know, people taking pictures of you, you know, I don't remember a whole lot. You know, this is a 69 year old brain that's waterlogged. I don't remember everything and I wish I had, but Katie is a sweetheart. She has so much heart. She is so humble. And I just texted her about a week or so ago because she moved from Stanford and is now at University of um, Florida and swimming with Anthony Nesty, who is more of a middle 
a middle distance distance coach and um, what she had at Stanford. And she's also an assistant coach there, volunteer assistant coach. So, you know, I said, congrats. She said, come see me. I want to see you. And, you know, so that that's really cool because I am just, you know, in awe of her. Well, Debbie, I, I will say that you are being a bit humble about this because there was so much written leading up to 2016 that she was chasing your history because she had the chance and then did accomplish three gold medals in one Olympics. And so, uh, you know, the way the media, listen to me, the way the media can set it up, um, it can be a competitive, a comparison thing. And I think your embrace of each other made it otherwise. However, she hasn't been thanking you as a friend or a big sister, she has been speaking words about your mentorship, about the specific intimacy that you have with the experience that she's having. I hear it in a way that's that's far beyond two people reaching out to each other saying, hi, you're great, keep going. Oh, well, thank you, Beth. And I've got to tell you a funny little story and I'll try and make it as fast as I can without the verbal diarrhea. Um, I've always thought of her prior to 16 as a doppelganger um, because her dad's, her dad, grandfather's name is Bud. My dad's name was Bud. She's born in Maryland. I was born in Maryland. She broke her right arm in fourth grade. I broke my right arm in fourth grade. <laughs> you know, we have all these little connections. You know, she loved racing against guys. My favorite person that I wanted to be is right there, Mike Burton. I wanted to be like <laughs> Mikey. I wanted to be like Mikey. He was my hero. He is who I looked up to. And, you know, I couldn't wait till he got home from UCLA every year. So then um, at the Olympic Games, which is even eerier, she won the 800 by like 10.5 seconds. I think I was 11.1. She won the 400 by um, five seconds. I was right around five seconds. She won the 400, 200 free, like by five tenths. And I won it by like four tenths. So it's really eerie how similar we are. And I am just so thankful it was her because she is such an awesome person. Well, thank you for sharing that because that validates some of what I feel when I watched the two of you and I didn't know any of these stories and it's really great that she's gonna continue swimming. If this was a game of popcorn, you kind of called out Mike next. So I have to go to Mike <laughs> next. <laughs> so Mike, I, I do want you to say something about the fact that going into these games, it was all about COVID and whether Japan should be holding an Olympic games, whether it was safe for the athletes. And these swimmers were going to be in a hall that had no spectators. How dramatically different would that experience have been for you as an athlete? And was it for them? It would have been totally different. But at the same time, it's the, the hand you're dealt. So you just go for it. You know? and, and I was, I was so pleased that our swimmers did so well. And because they, you know, they were put in a spot with the, you know, they didn't know if, the, you know, they could swim an event and then the next day come down with COVID and they'd be out of their home. And we dealt with that a little bit down in Mexico City with the Turista. And uh, I lost 15 pounds before my 400 freestyle and then uh, had to come back and swim my 1500. So it was, uh, it wasn't easy, but. You know, at the same time, with COVID, it could knock you right out of the, you'd have to go home, you know, so. Mike, it's, I, feel, it's I, well. I feel like I should go into just a little bit more of your background because you've now expressed a couple times how you are about challenges and adversity. Is this story correct that you went to swimming after a pretty bad bike accident? Yeah, when I was 13, I got hit by a large furniture truck dislocated my right hip and uh, uh, tore the ligaments in my right knee. And uh, throughout, my, throughout my career in life now, people, a lot of people, you know, collect tattoos. I collect scars. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've got both knees replaced, my right hip replaced. And so it's been, uh, it's been quite a charity that way. But, uh, your, uh, 
you're bionic. That's what you're supposed to say. <laughs> <laughs> Becoming bionic. Yeah. Was there one person who instilled that idea of um, no obstacles? You just keep going. Or did you have that as a younger person, younger than that accident? Easy answer. Sherm Shabor. Oh, wow. You know? And he was, he was the guy I, uh, I looked up to and uh, tried to, you know, find out his history and things like that. It, it, he was a great man. I, um, I miss him terribly. Well, Mark, let's talk a little bit about these Tokyo games, because I think I saw on social media that you had jumped out in front even before the games and put out your plan for how the games could go forward, regardless of whether people were vaccinated or Japan felt COVID safe. And then the topic of mental health emerged and it became um, sort of um, the highest boat that rose up out of the games, the, the enduring topic that I think is going to change future Olympics. So maybe little needs to be said about the fact that the games were being so threatened or challenged or um, contentious because of COVID and more about athletes and mental health. Could I, could I just get your observation on that? Yeah, sure. Thanks uh, for that question. Um, it's a very personal thing when people are in a public environment where they have to be observed so often and the demands of how they perform as an athlete uh, obviously can wear on each individual athlete differently. Um, I think uh, Summer uh, talked a little bit about the fact that with Title IX and this and that, and she had to turn professional and she kind of regretted that thought and whatever. Today, these athletes, unlike Debbie, Mike, and myself, we never came to an Olympic Games with an agent, a strategist, a trainer, a psychologist, uh, a negotiator, um, and a lot of obligations contractually. Um, there has never been any comment that somebody's actually said, um, well, I've got to do well because my sponsor expects me to. And that would, I've never heard of a story like that. But you knowing know that that sort of is an underlying theme that you want to do well because you want to get renewed. Um, in mental health, there's a variety of things of the pressure that builds up over the expectation. We first saw this uh, with Michael Phelps, for an example, uh, where he had made um, a clarification and an acknowledgement that he was having a problem trying to get back into not necessarily the mainstream of life to be just lost in a crowd, but his stream of life. And the same thing that we saw with Simone Biles. Um, look, if, if Michael doesn't feel good about himself, the worst that's gonna happen is he's gonna miss a turn. Um, with Simone, she won't be able to complete a task and she can break her neck and kill herself. So the, the consequence, and the severity of how that besets an athlete is, is, is rather intense. I think that she, under the circumstances, <clears throat> did the right thing for her. And, and because that's what she did. And we all have to respect that. And I think that there's a reason that we have to respect that. It's not because of our selfishness that we want to see her win another gold medal. She's won many. And I doesn't diminish the ones that she won or the ones that we expected her to win. What it does is it tells me that there was much, much more importance in life to one's well-being after the lights have been turned off and she has to go back home and she has to live with herself. And she wasn't avoiding, I don't believe, the fear of competition because she was so good at that. But as Nadia Komenich has told me, I'm a very good friend of hers for the last almost 30 years because I was talking to her while this was going on every single day, what's going on, what's happening? And she says, well, let's, let's put a perspective on this. She started to be at the top when she was like 14 years old, but she's like in her mid twenties now. So it's not like she hasn't been through this rodeo before. And she's now understanding the consequences of not being as focused because she is a little older, even though she wouldn't want to admit it until she actually had a practice incident, um, which I didn't know about and they didn't focus on that. So she basically took the position that she was in. Um, and I believe that all athletes should have to review where they are, how they feel about where they want to be, 
regardless of what the expectation is of the public's expectation, uh, whether or not the sponsors think that they should, they should be doing something. Um, and this is a hard decision to make as an athlete. I, I, I know that I had a conversation with Sherm Shavor. That's not exactly the same. And I didn't understand whether it was a mental problem. I think it was a psychological problem to the extent that I just didn't want to do anymore. On my sixth event in Munich, I didn't want to swim it because I thought, hmm, tomorrow I'm going to swim the relay. Isn't it better to win six gold medals for six tries than what happened to him in the 100 free? But he told me that I've got to work through this. I've trained for this. I'm the world record holder. And I go, yeah, but I have the least margin of error in winning over the field. And he says, but that's not important. I said, well, how am I supposed to win the race? He says, I want you to go out fast. And I says, well, that's fine. What do I do about finishing the race? He says, I want you to get faster on the second lap. <laughs> I go, well, yeah, well, that was easily said. He says, that's what we've trained for. Just go back to that place. So he got me out of that kind of a depression that lasted for about four hours of this constant conversation I had with him at the Olympic Village. Was that having a mental breakdown? Sure. Would have I been wrong to not swim it? No. But I elected to suffer the consequences of total failure. Um, and I think that all athletes go through some sort of a, a mental struggle. Um, and, and, I, and it always comes on at the most inopportune time. That's all I can say. Well, and I think, Mark, uh, please correct these numbers if I'm wrong, but you were swimming 14 races in eight days in that time period. So the Yeah, yeah. I actually, sw I was... I was, I swam 15 times in the water wow. over an eight day period of time. <clears throat> so, and Michael Phelps, I think swam 17 times to win eight gold medals. Well, or, like or, I said, or, I, yeah, I but, but guess what? It doesn't matter if we're in one event. Um, if you're in an event that's longer than 200 meters, you only have to swim the prelims and the finals. The ang the, the angst is the same. <laughs> I'm telling you from yeah, getting up in the morning, yeah. just to work out. And, yeah, you know, and warm up. I, I, I want to restate that it your schedule matters at all because you're right. It could be one event, one race, whatever um, that that place. And fortunately, this is going to be an ongoing conversation. And Nadia Komanich, being Romanian, it's remarkable how Americanized she's become over time to be able to talk in a nuanced way about the struggle of mental health and athletes and the way she has had to come to terms with her own. I mean, I just want to point out something to the audience that's listening. Each one of us on this panel um, spent our whole life at that time, more than half our life. I started swimming when I was uh, about eight years old and I retired at 22. So two thirds of my life was involved in swimming. And although I was exposed to other things in life up until I was 22, it was my whole life. And then all of a sudden to be left, well, what do I do now? Well, I went through college, um, graduated degree in biochemistry, and I got accepted into dental school. And so I knew where I was going. But Michael Phelps didn't know where he was going. Right. He, he didn't have to go to school because of professionalism. And he could afford, to, he made a lot of money. And everybody in his camp was basically interested in what he wanted to do. But nobody was thinking about what he would do five years from now and in 10 years. And as a result, this is what we see happen, not only to him, but every athlete that plants all their importance on, I'm going to be successful. And even when they are successful, if, if you fail to prepare, you're prepared to fail in some other form of life. And athletics is not always the form of life that you can take. Of course, Debbie and Mike went into coaching, um, and that's a form of being in the same sport, but not in the sense that they, they came as an athlete and then turned into a coach, and they're great coaches. But most of the athletes that I know, whether it's in track and field or in gymnastics, they don't go on to do that, and nobody helps them. Right. And that's and why all of a sudden they get into these issues of depression. Mark, I want to add another dimension to that. And, and that brings Jeff into this conversation, because when I emailed this summer and said, I'd like to hear your thoughts about the Tokyo Games, Jeff wrote, being a member of the 1980 boycotted team, my heart has gone out to these athletes because their performance has been delayed by COVID, their ability to qualify and get to the Olympics has been delayed. 
He said, before attending the trials, I honestly believe that I'd be of service to an honorary team after the IOC called off those games. And then Jeff raises the question that if the IOC has a net worth of $6 billion, why didn't it ensure that the Japanese population was fully vaccinated in preparation for the games? So that's a provocative point, Jeff, but the point I wanna to get to is that gap, if you strive and get to that pinnacle point of your dreams, you're, you've made the Olympic team, but the Olympics doesn't happen or is delayed or deferred, then what? Well, in my case, you know, it, it was how quickly things changed. And uh, I did go through kind of a personal depression. Uh, I moved back home uh, before the trial happened. And, we didn't have those resources, and now I'm really proud that, you know, mental health is, is getting uh, attention the same as physical health. And, um, you know, that back when we were swimming, it was uh, we, we always had these psych out games that we play with other athletes, and it was, you know, the Sherman was like, get tough, and, and that was kind of the way we, you know, came, came out of those uh, the mental aspect of it. And so it was um, the hardest thing I, for me to really envision in my race, it was the crowd, the home crowd was what made it so spectacular. And I can't imagine walking out with all that training and not having the energy of the people you know, that are in the stand. And that's the, that's the, that's the Olympic experience. And, and so that for me was, was the hardest thing to try to relate to with the, the athletes in addition to how fast they, they swam in spite of the challenges to get water time, you know, to deal with the, the, the lockdown and, and everything else and, and school and everything else. It was just, it was incredible how fast they swam when they got to the trial in, in the Olympics. And so that's really, you know, when you combine those two factors, it's really uh, mind boggling how, how well they did. Um, and, and, and the mental aspect was, was very, um, uh, you know, there's room for these greater problems to, to arise, uh, especially when kids are going to college and they're, they're, they're expecting an NCAA. Right? And they, then COVID hit in March and they couldn't go to NCAA and then the trials were messed up and it was just, you know, everything was up here. So uh, it was just, um, uh, I could relate you know, from the Haiti team, uh, you know, the boycott or the similarity, but um, a lot different in, in ways. As well. well, the other factor is that because of the delay, it's only three years till Paris, till the 2024 games. So the time is crunched between now and then. I do want to note that we're hearing a little bit from the audience. Thank you to Jim Lerner for his comments and to Sylvia Navari, who said, it's such a pleasure seeing and hearing from these five Olympians. I have lived in Sacramento since 1973, and we know, Sylvia, that you've followed their careers. So with that, I think you all deserve to be in a Sacramento sports gallery on Zoom, don't you think? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to say thanks to Chris Smith, because Chris is our technology guru, and he is, he's the one who's having so much fun with all of this. <laughs> what do you think about hanging on the wall? How is it, Summer? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And you feel like you're in that Van Gogh, you know, display that's going around the country. Right, right. This is your <laughs> close up, everybody. So um, I'm going to bring you back into the present right now. And I'm Beth Ruiak, by the way, if you're just joining us, I am talking about with five gold medal Olympians, um, incredible swimmers who have called Sacramento home. And in fact, we'll get to Jeff Float in a middle in a minute and, and talk about the fact that he's really close to home today. But Summer, um, let me ask you about transitioning then into life and making decisions in in a civilian way after the Olympic experience. How'd that go for you? Well, um, that's actually a perfect question for right now because. I did not know what I was doing. I mean, I was 19, as I said earlier, and I knew I wanted to win an Olympic gold medal. Um, beyond that, I didn't know what I wanted to do after I was done with the Olympic games. But my best girlfriend, who just happens to be in the other room, 
they're all literally right there. And I keep looking this way because I have the ocean right here and I live in the mountains. So I, I'm, I can't not look at the waves crashing when you hear them crashing. Um, but my best girlfriend who's in the other room said to me, she said, what are you gonna do? Cause I took a quarter off of Stanford after the Olympic games and I traveled to Japan and, and made some money. And, and then she said, well, where are you gonna live when you come back for winter quarter? And I said, I don't know, I'll figure it out classic summer and she goes no 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 you need to be grounded and you need to have a foundation and so she shared her room with me and so my junior year at Stanford we lived off campus because we were not guaranteed housing for all four years we lived in this duplex literally everyone that lived with me is in that room over there we had six girls downstairs six girls upstairs Heidi and I shared what is now probably the size of most people's bathrooms that was our room I borrowed a dresser from our landlord. I put a piece of plywood on top of that and a futon on top of that. Now, mind you, this is in like the Bay Area just after the 89 earthquake. And here we are. We had like stereos barely attached to the wall. I mean, it was unsafe. But this was my bed. This was my dresser. This was my desk. And so you say transitioning back. I always say I was in the best place. Um, to be normal and to be humbled. And that was Stanford University. I came back to like just kind of greatness all around me. I mean, I didn't even know Google was being invented and Yahoo over here and exceptional people everywhere. I was just in the mix, right? And, uh, and most importantly, I had my friends and they kept me very real and very grounded. Um, so I moved uh, straight into uh, trying to go back to swimming. Uh, going to school, I was working and somewhere in there, as I said to you before, I was in the middle of the swimming pool and I said to myself, why are you doing this? It was in the middle of a hard set. I was like, why are you doing this? And it was the first time I ever asked myself why. It was like brushing my teeth. It was drinking water. It was eating. That's what swimming was to me. It's like, I can't live without it. It's and then that night I realized I actually would survive without swimming and it might be kind of fun. And that's the first time I said it out loud. And then I wrote down my pros and cons. Anybody else do a pros and cons list? I do. <laughs> and the only two things I really wanted to do was break a world record and win a gold medal on the nighttime relay. And those two things just weren't keeping me in it. So I decided to move on. And luckily, as Mark had said, I do the same thing with young swimmers I rem and frankly, just young people. It's possible to have two passions at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can be a professional athlete and be thinking about your next step. And frankly, you probably should be so that you can have another drive, another passion that you move into. So I knew I wanted to work in television. It was the closest I could get to that adrenaline rush of live competition. And I took every audition that came my way um, some I got, some I didn't, and some I got that I didn't like and knew I never want to do again, which is also a great way to learn what your path is. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and so that's, that's the story of that. Well, I always in, admired that you held on to your family as tightly as you did and grew as independently as you did. And I think, um, that's my coach too. Um, I know we spoke about Mike Hastings, but I just think in this day and age and the power of coaches and the imbalance of power with, you know, young people and young women specifically, I loved the fact that Mike always taught me to be my own coach. Um, I love the fact that I could go to meets by myself and I would warm myself up and I didn't think twice about whether or not I was going to be capable of swimming fast. I had many national team teammates that if their coach was not on the pool deck or if they did not have the piece of paper that their coach wrote for them, they just couldn't put it together. And Mike taught me to be that person. And anyway, so we've all spoken about our coaches. They're amazing influences on our lives. Um, I'm so grateful for them. Mike, I want to jump over to you because this is October and in terms of going to the next Olympic cycle or beginning the restart to a season, October is an important time of year. Um, do, you, do you feel that cycle in you? Do you 
do you still kind of respond as if you have this built-in memory of the cycles of training and swimming? Yeah, I wish I did, but I don't. <laughs> I'm gonna next year. I'm gonna turn 75 years old. Wow, and that's a milestone for me and my family, because uh, the burdens don't last very long. Uh, they tend to have problems with hearts and things like that. So, yeah, I uh, I don't. I love watching the sport now. I mean, don't get me wrong; it is so cool what the athletes can do. Uh, nowadays, and I was in Australia in uh, 2000 for 98. I was invited over by Herb Elliott to go to lunch, and it was a luncheon with all their big name sponsors uh, for the Sydney Games. And we were there were seven of us invited, and we were on stage, and the uh, the MC who had a microphone, and we were all mic. So the people in the audience could hear us, and he asked questions about you know um, our training, how we went about this and that and everything. And there were seven of us on the stage. Uh, John Conrad's was sitting over here. He won the fifteen hundred in Melbourne in nineteen fifty six, and then Murray Rose was sitting next to him, and he won the fifteen hundred in Rome in nineteen sixty. And then uh, Bobby Wendell won it in 64 in Tokyo. And these are all three Australian guys. And uh, I won it in 68, 72. And Vladimir Solnikov won it in 80 and 88. And had they not boycotted the games, he could have been the first triple winner, which would have been fantastic. And, and what a gentleman he is. I really enjoyed meeting him. But uh, so there were seven of us. Um, five were Australian, uh, Grant, uh, Aaron Perkins, Grant Hackett were the last two. They were also Australian. So they were just, uh, Vladimir and myself on the dais. And as they went down the line asking, you know, what were our coaches techniques, you know, what were your swimming techniques, you know, and stuff like that. Rose, Conrad's, Bobby Window all said, well, you know, everything's better now. The pools are better. Main lines are better. The coaching's better. The, even the kids that swim are better. And then it was my turn. And I said, you know, if the guys to my left will just stand up, I'll show you why it's faster and better now. And they all stood up and I stood up and I'm a foot and a half, two feet shorter than anybody on the stage, okay? So, and when I go to like the Olympic trials to watch and everything else, it's like walking through a forest of giants. These guys are huge. Hmm. And I have all the faith in the world that in future Olympics, we're gonna do very well. Oh, well, Mike, if it hadn't been swimming in your life, what else would it have been? What else would you have done? I love to play football. I, I like hitting people. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I really enjoyed that. And my mom used to get so upset with me because we had a park out in front of our house. And I'd be out there playing football, you know, just with the other kids. And, uh, you know, she'd get all mad because I wasn't supposed to play because of the dis dislocated hips. So. <laughs> They must have been so happy that you landed in a sport where you stay in your own lane and don't touch anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're very excited about that. Yeah. Mike, did you ever play water polo? I tried, you know, and I tried with one of the greatest coaches ever, Bob Horn. Bob Horn. But I'll tell you what, I I had no ball sense at all. I, mean, <laughs> I would get the ball and I'd go, what do I do with it, Bob? <laughs> See, how did you do an eight beater kick, Mike? Oh, Mike, yeah. how'd you do egg beater kick? I couldn't. <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> okay, we got to get you guys back into gallery view so everyone can see you. And Jeff, I want you to talk about a little bit about that wall behind you, where you are, and who's with you today. Well, uh, I am at the birthplace of where all this 
magic happen at the Arden Hills uh, Social Athletic Club. And I'm in the, uh, the legacy lounge of the Shabur restaurant. And behind me is um, kind of a collage of all the great performances that Mark and Debbie and Mike and myself and a few others. And um, you can kind of look and see behind here, there's some uh, swimming, you know, black, a lot of black and white photos of the day, um, you know, with uh, here at Arden Hill. So uh, these walls are talking today. And uh, <laughs> that's where I am. And so, um, well, yeah, there's another you know, one of our teammates, Susie Peterson, right behind your yes. left ear, Jeff. That's right Susie. And then, uh, yeah, uh, Mike above her. There's some old relay teammates of mine. There's Scott Mepper and his son actually made the team in the Twitter Baptist last uh, try, uh, Olympics. And um, we have Sherm and Mark and Charlie the Tuna swimming there in, in, in um, <laughs> the, uh, the kind of uh, English Channel. And, and basically, you know, the history of this club. And um, so uh, I, I'm kind of reliving all that as I speak with you today. So it's kind of cool. I, is is Sharon Shabor there? Um, no, she um, uh, actually she lived around the corner from where you used to live. Yeah, I um, thought she might have dropped in today, but Summer uh, put Summer put in the chat a question to all of you, and and Summer, why don't you just say it so they can hear what you were wondering? Well, I have my favorite pool, but I just was wondering everybody else's favorite Northern Cali Northern California pool to swim in, compete in. For competition. Hmm. We didn't have <laughs> as many nice pools as you had. No, I didn't have any. We didn't remember. Stanford pool was fabulous, oh, but Stanford I never got was... to compete in it. I coached there, but I didn't get to compete in it. Okay, well, we did have Stanford, but we didn't have as many there at Stanford when I was there. No, it was just the 125 yard pool <laughs> when I was there. <laughs> no, we had a 50 meter pool. They had the one before Bellardi pool. Was Arden um, Pools the premier pool? Pardon me? Was Arden Hills the premier pool in your uh, yeah. well, me, well, we had a lot of Junior Olympics there. Yeah. Sherman held Junior Olympics. He actually held the 62 Indoor Nationals, was it, Mike? That's correct. I think it was the, the, 60, <laughs> the 62 Indoor Nationals outside. Well, I, my favorite pool is the, his... the Women's Nationals. Just the Women's, yes. Yeah. And what's really odd is one day I was... Looking at the pool, I go, Sherm, why is this number 110, 220, 440 listed on the tiles? He goes, well, those were the yardages then. I go, what? I said, how did you, how did you time them? They would string flags across the pool and they'd have timers on the side. And when the swimmer would go through the little flags, they would stop the watch. Yeah. My Crazy. favorite pool of all time was the LA Coliseum. Mine too, mine too. It, it was fast. It's uh, just outside the LA Coliseum, right? Yeah, yeah. Mark, yeah. do you remember my dad disqualifying you more, on a false <laughs> start at the LA Coliseum? <laughs> Um, yes, I do. <laughs> Never forgotten it, Debbie. Never you know, um, it. <laughs> I, you know, you, you, she asked a question about Northern California. Um, the fastest pool I swam in in Northern California was, or the one I enjoyed the most because it was so beautiful, was Foothill College. Yes, that yep. pool. That was a oh gorgeous. man, that was just like that. That was a great oh, place to swim. Western. Um, Except for the afternoons when it got windy. Yeah, well, I mean, we had our All high school. The Bay Area was windy. Yeah, we, we had our high school championships there. Um, at the time I was in high school, uh, we swam as a high school team against Stanford, but they had a pool that was built like in the 30s, 1930s, and, and it wasn't a great pool. It had obviously a lot of tradition. And I'll have to echo what Mike said. The fastest pool in its day and it's been changed now and re reconfigured, but was the LA Coliseum pool. Um, I always wondered if whether or not it was really 50 meters, <laughs> but well, I did, I swam in Europe a lot and I broke more than half of my world records, not in the United States. And one of the pools that I did really well in is in Leipzig, East Germany, because it was East Germany at that time. 
And I went up to Roland Mathis, who was the great East German swimmer. And I said to him, I said, is this really 50 meters? And he said, I think so. <laughs> Mark, was my mom the chaperone well, on that trip? Yeah, I, I believe she might have been. But, yeah. you know, I was in 1972. Um, I was uh, flowing down there by CBS to the L.A. Coliseum to try to see if I could break a world record in the 100 fly. Um, and this was before the Olympic trials in 1972. So I flew down there and I was only swimming in one race. And of course they didn't have a warm up pool. They had some kind of pool that was kind of half circled and it was only like about three feet deep. It was a baby pool. Literally you could sit in it or wash your feet off or something like this. So what I did was, um, it got really hot in the middle of the day. And uh, I think it was the, about four o'clock or three o'clock in the afternoon when the finals were, cause it was all done for TV. And I said to Frank Heckel, who was from Southern California, went to USC, I said, let's fall start because I'm, I'm just going to do something. And he says, OK, go ahead. Yeah, I'll do that, too. Of course, he said, called everybody their marks. And it, in those days, they had uh, a, a three in the field, which meant that you could have um, three. Uh, everybody fall start twice, but whoever went in on a third time, you'd get disqualified. So this was the first time we were called to the marks. And I dove in. And the next thing I know, there was this guy named Mr. Graham who came over, who was the starter. And Debbie, I think your father was the meat official, whatever. And they concurred that if you deliberately false start, and it was not, I mean, it was if you intentionally false start, I'll start yeah. you, know, um, you could be disqualified. But nobody had filled them in that CBS had paid for my plane ticket, my hotel room, and that I was supposed <laughs> to be this match race with Frank Heckel. And once they made that decision, and frankly, if I had swum the race, it would have lasted less than a minute. But we spent 10 minutes explaining what the rules were. And I was all part of, going, okay, okay, okay. Well, at least, hey, guess what? I had a nice little trip here down for two days. And I didn't swim the event. Wow. TV broadcast rights get you a little more uh, distance nowadays. <laughs> yeah, that, that LA pool had, that LA pool, the reason why it was so fast was they, in one end, they had a, 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 a heater that came out. And it was like a swimming flume in lane one. And it came, made the pool like a giant whirlpool from one wow. lane one to lane eight. Well, yeah, they fact, also had 10-foot deep gutters. And yeah. the deep end was, well, what, 17 feet deep? And the That's shallow right. end was eight feet? Yeah. You know something? You mentioned something about that, Debbie. The pools that they have now are only two meters, which is a little over six feet. And when you swim in a pool that's actually that shallow, and I consider it shallow, it's like swimming in the Bonneville salt flats. Because when you make a turn, I can't see the other end of the pool. When you dove off in the shallow end, which, by the way, was about seven or eight feet deep, even mm -hmm. at the LA Coliseum pool, and you looked to a pool that was actually 18 feet deep, I could actually see the target from the moment I pushed off, and even without goggles in those days. So it actually came up real fast. The worst part was actually swimming back. But they had to turn the jets off, and Jeff is correct. They had a filtration system that basically in some lanes was an advantage, but they turned that off during the competition. But it was still a fast pool for whatever the reason is. And they tried to copy pools like that, but they could never duplicate it. I love uh, the technical aspect of hearing you all talk. You can talk about your strokes, your sport, your event, the pools, whatever. Meanwhile, Summer is getting distracted by someone on the beach and she <laughs> has been looking out the window. I got, I have to know what's going on. What are you doing, Summer? Well, this is, <laughs> these are all my college friends. And oh, so we want to see them. We want to see them. Well, now they're behaving, but I think it's cocktail hour. And so they <laughs> started getting out and they went for a walk on the beach. And then I said to my friend, Glennis, why don't you come up behind me? Like there's a closet right here. I'm like, why don't you yeah. just go up and be all creepy behind me? And she's like, nah, Oh, we're almost 50. We need to get it together. Oh, <laughs> that's our age. We need to 50. Do it. You're a youngin. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, no, I don't know. But I feel it. I'm fine with 50. It's just hilarious that uh, that my kids make fun of me now. I like it's it's hilarious. And I get such joy and pleasure out of embarrassing them that it's not right. I told my son, I go, I joined a bowling league. He goes, You're getting old. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, family members who are swimmers. Anybody have a competitive? Mark does. Mark does, that's right. My sister, Nancy, uh, was the American record holder in the 200-yard freestyle. Yeah. And she was expected to 
qualify for the 200 free at the Olympic trials in 72. Um, but like anything else, um, the pressure and the magnitude of what that competition meant. She just on that day, just had a bad swim, bad pacing, whatever it was. But um, yeah, my younger sister, Nancy was, and she swam at Arden Hills with Sherm. So that would have been interesting at that time. Matter of fact, at that same Olympics, I think Rick Colella, who was a breaststroker, sister made the same Olympic team in 1972. Mm -hmm. Lynn, yeah. Yeah. Well, my well, brother, Debbie, you know Trevor. Uh, Most everybody yes, I do knows know Trevor. Trevor. I know Trevor, Trevor is ridiculously famous in Sacramento and all of Northern California. He owns a ton of quick service restaurants, but he's so kind and so giving. Um, so my brother, imagine this when he was a junior in high school. And I know this because this is what his license said. He was 5'2", 95 pounds, a junior <laughs> in high school. He's wow. now about six feet and I won't give his weight, but he decided- <laughs> Wait, he's still in shape. He does oh, yeah. Iron Man all the time. Yeah, no, 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 he's in great shape, but I have, I have no idea. I mean, you can get in trouble yeah. with guys by saying they don't weigh enough and uh -huh. they weigh too much, you know? So either way, it's like- the no win situation. But anyway, well, he was a great sprinter. That's what I'm trying to say. So you have to understand my brother's claim to fame. He decided his junior year, maybe I have a shot at a college scholarship in swimming. He was a really, really talented athlete and could, and was really good at everything, but not fantastic at one thing. So he gave this swimming a shot all in his junior year. And his claim to fame is he was a sprinter and he stood on the blocks and he was sandwiched between Tom Jagger and Matt Bianchi. And here was this 5'2 kid. And I'm not going to tell you what place he got. He survived that moment. But it's still one of his greatest stories. Was oh, great. he swimming for Doug at that time? No, no. This was, he was Mike Hastings. Mike at the, after that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think in that spirit, let's wrap this up with a thought from each of you about What's important to say to young people right now? And I think it's far bigger than about their sport or uh, about exactly what they wanna be someday. It's about being a person, being a good person in these times and being a person that can navigate challenges that as you've all established, and I'll put myself in the same group, we never had to deal with. We didn't have tools to face them. And, and we didn't necessarily have people who would have known the answers anyway around us. So where do we go with young people? Um, Jeff, let me start with you because you're in the midst as a coach and you have lots of young people around you and they really look to you. Well, it, you know, the generation uh, coming up uh, has a, a lot of work cut out for them. It, 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 learning the skill that um, from, from swimming, especially, and how you're going to apply those in your life. And that's really the fundamental that we all, I think, you know, grew up with. And, and, and what worked for us then works, you know, for the kid today with the, with the training and um, the discipline and learning how to mind, body, and spirit of what athletics is all about. And um, you have to have each one of those components, you've got to, you've got to feed those. And, and um, you know, for me, the, the mind, body, spirit component was alive and well um, here at Arden Hills and in the heroes that I had and, and having the mentors and teachers that they to look up to. And um, we all need to have a mentor uh, to, to help get us through these tough times and, and finding that passion for something that you, that you love to do. Right. And, um, I I think, Jeff, I'm going to hold you at passion right there. I think that's a good one. I'm, I want to get through everybody here. So, Debbie, what about your message to young people? Follow your heart with desire, determination, and dedication for whatever path you're going to take, and be kind. Hmm. Mike, what strikes you as, as a thing to say to young people that's helpful and important right now? I'll worry about it. And, uh, you know, we have movements now. And it seems like every time we get in tr trouble with ourselves, we have a movement. And, uh, you know, everybody matters out there, everyone. Mm -hmm. And we just, like Debbie said, be, we need to be kind because that's what it's all about. 
You know, if somebody needs a, a hand up, give them a hand. Uh, you know, and just go go with it. And again, find something you love and do it well. Uh, it's the passion again. Summer, you've got kids in your own home and maybe they don't necessarily listen to their parents like all kids, but, <laughs> but, but if they could, what would you want them to really know? Um, well, I think consistency and patience. Um, I changed my message from, to young kids from you can be anything you want to as long as you work hard and put your mind to it. I'd, I'd like to remind kids to be bold and use their voices, um, but be patient enough to think before they speak, have the guts to stand up for others and stand up for themselves and what they want. Um, I think practicing those skills is incredibly overlooked and I think it should be practiced just like we practice our sports and our studies. Um, kindness is key and um, consistency and patience with life and yourself. Okay, we just have a very short amount of time, Mark. What, what's your message to young people? Well, it's what I tell people when I have a chance to talk to people in, in an audience and, um, and everybody can relate to this. It was the mystery, the magic, the wonder, and the innocence of never having done it before. And that was the seeds of creativity that developed into my success story. Each and every one of us has that innocence and has that dream, and that our destiny isn't a matter of chance, but the choices that we make. It's something that you can't wait around for to happen just dropping out of the sky. It's something that you actually actively have to go out and try to achieve as, as best as you can. And so it's never too late to be the person that you thought you could be. That's my message. That's wonderful. Very nice, Mark. So meaningful. Yeah. yeah, why don't you give yourselves a round of applause for all of you? Because I think this has been such an amazing conversation. Thank you all for your time. I need a, a quick show of hands. Who has been in the pool today or is getting in the pool? How about I, got, I, was, <laughs> this morning. I was I was there yesterday. <laughs> I okay, was in the hot tub home. last night after golf. <laughs> yesterday, I'm right in the ocean. Okay. Someone should be in the ocean now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our Olympians, Mike Burton, yeah. <laughs> Debbie Meyer Weber, Mark Spitz, Jeff Float, and Summer Sanders Schlopey. Thank you all so very much. Take care. It was an Thank absolute you, Beth. Joy. Thank hey, you. Hey, love you all. Take care. Love you yes. all. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Great. Bye. Thank you. Bye. And I'm Beth Ruiak, so glad to have been your host today. Thank you for Sacramento's Olympic gold medalist forum and the Renaissance Society. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Beth. And we wanna um, say from the Renaissance Society, we can't thank you all enough for just sharing your stories and um, giving us such a great day. Uh, just as a small thank you, we'd like each of you to be honorary members in the Renaissance Society. We'll be contacting you with that information. And also to let you know, we'll be giving a donation in your names to the Seth Nelson Student Emergency Grant Fund. Uh, for those of you who only came in in the middle, I'd like to see uh, it again. Today's presentation was recorded. You can view it on our Renaissance Society YouTube channel or through the link on the Renaissance website. Next week, we have Dr. Rita Cameron Wedding joining us. Um, despite the persistent racial disparities across all the public systems, many people do not believe systemic, systemic racism exists. Dr. Cameron Wedding was chair of the Women's Studies Department at CSUS for 23 years. She'll discuss how our implicit biases can simultaneously obscure and contribute to systemic racism. So thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next week.